Hi, this is Tim and welcome to Talks with Tim. And today I want to go over my video list with you. If any of you converse with me in YouTube comments, you know, a lot of times I'll say thanks for suggesting. I'll put it on the list when you ask about something. And occasionally I need to thin the list out or at least prioritize the list. So right now we have actually 102 video ideas. And yeah, obviously I can't do 102 videos in at least the immediate future. So I want to go over them with you and get your feedback on what you think we ought to do. So a few that we're finishing up, uh, we have actually, actually have two that are with or that are collaborative series. We have our conveyor series and our PID series. What do you think? How, do, how have those been going so far? I think the conveyor series has given us some good practical applications for some of our programming methods and the PID series, oh boy, that if there's ever a series that I put way too much time into, it's definitely been that one. But I hope I've been successful at really, I don't want to say dumbing down PIDs because, yeah, I can get in trouble for saying that, but really breaking down the math into some small chunks that I think you could nibble on a little bit. And you didn't need a calculus degree to actually interpret. But should I find some other kind of, I don't know, real world moving trainers to try to play with. I kind of like the idea of a robot. I really like the idea of a robot, but uh, I don't get any robots coming through the shop. So I don't know, <laughs> I don't know I'd ever pull that one off. But let me know in the comments, what are some practical applications you'd like to see on that? Our HMI series, it should be finishing up soon. And we have a small safety series going on. You know, one that I really want to get back on is our STEM with Tim series that I was doing with the kids. And not just for my kids. I really want to work on some content that you can take and go to your local school and kind of show the kids what we do. So hopefully I'll get back on that one. I uh, see uh, Connected Components Workbench. I've got where are the JSRs in CCW? I've got one about VIT shifts, and then I did a timer reset because it was a little different than RS Logics 500, but I didn't do a counter reset. And somebody asked for that. Oh, and there's a really neat new feature in CCW that I think I'm, I'm going to play with and hopefully do a video on is the data log upload utility. They have made it pretty sweet to be able to upload the data logs from a micro 800. Actually, I hadn't even talked about the data logs. So I'm probably going to do that and then show you how we can automate the uploading of them and get some really cool information out of the PLC. And also when I was doing my how to message between the Micro 800 and the Compact Logix Control Logix, I did leave out the Micro Logix and Slick PLCs. So we're going to do some more messaging videos. See, and then Studio 5000, we're getting ready to actually really roll on another build out of that series, going through some start stop methods, one shots. We're going to break down how the scan cycle works in the Control Logics and Compact Logics PLC compared to the Micro 800 and the Micro Logics and the Slick PLCs. We're going to work with some math and manipulation using both the compute instructions and using our basic add, subtract, multiply, divides. We're going to talk about controller and program scope tag because we get a lot of questions on what the difference between those are and when you should use what. We're going to talk about some of the alarming features in Studio 5000 and we're going to do some produce and consume tags. And we're going to do it over some basic networking connections. And we're going to do it over some more complex network connections. We're going to dig deeper into diagnosing controller faults and logging and alarming on controller faults and about fault handling routines and power up handling routines. Uh, we're going to hit add on the instructions and user defined data types. And then we're going to delicately skip through the minefield of Ladder logic versus structured text versus function block. And not, I shouldn't even use the word versus there. I got to come up with something better, but we're going to talk about, we're just going to try to get a basic understanding of them and see what might be good applications for which one. And hopefully begin to learn how they are very similar in so many ways, because in the end, I just don't want you to see a structured text routine and be like, <laughs> That is not my department. Or, you know, it's probably on the exact opposite side as somebody who writes structured text being like, oh, ladder logic, that is so old, I, that is beneath me. I just want us to be able to read and understand them. So that that's coming up. 
We're going to talk about program task types and how we can use the different ones depending on our application. Someone asked about how we could alarm on the key switch position. You know, with cybersecurity, a lot of people are not wanting to leave the PLCs in remote now. So we're going to talk about how to alarm, whether it's in remote or if it's in run, because really function-wise on machine, you can't tell the difference. An interesting one here is how long has the PLC been off for? So in this case, depending on how long the PLC has been off, or mainly the power has been off to the machine, the programmer needed to start up in different ways. So if it only been off for like 15 minutes, you could start up and resume. But if it had been off for maybe two hours, I don't remember the exacts, then it needed to go through a more thorough process. So that was, that was a kind of a neat one. So I'm going to share that one with you. Then our HMI series, we'll probably continue building out. You know, the one that I'm, I keep getting a quest, so many questions about, and I just don't know that I want to tackle is ideas on making pleasing HMIs. And that just seems like a minefield worse than ladder versus structure text versus function blocks. But I may dabble on a few things. I'm not sure about that one yet. Then we have a whole batch of videos that we're getting ready to do just on the PowerFlex drive alone. We've done some basic two wire control, three wire control, and we've dabbled a little bit in analog control, but one that you can do minus 10 to plus 10 speed control. So you can do some crude positioning with it. Also the analog output on the PowerFlex, we're gonna play with it. And then without even a PLC, you know, you can do basic two wire four to 20 milliamp control and four wire four to 20 milliamp control using PIDs. We're gonna mix it up more with the PowerFlex and CCW. You know, we did a really quick primer video on that, but there were a lot of features in that Connected Components Workbench user-defined function block for the PowerFlex. So we're gonna play with that some more. We haven't really talked about some of the basics like cell, D cell. So we're gonna hit that. How do you wire the inputs on it to a button or an output to a light? We haven't really hit that yet. No, I do. I wanna go through a really basic, let's get down and dirty because really, as much as networking is cool and that we can control these over ethernet, there's still a lot of drives out there with hardwire control. So we need to know how to troubleshoot them. Measuring motor voltage. Now that's a really neat one. Um, and here, here's a primer for everybody. Well, you don't even need our trainer. If you just have a drive, take your El Cheapo voltmeter and measure the voltage coming out of the drive. You're gonna notice some really wacko readings. So we're gonna talk about why that is and how we can measure it. We're gonna talk about doing some basic control with it. Cause obviously we can do some preset frequencies so we can you know, change the speed based off of certain conditions. We can also change our speed reference. And then we're gonna start trying to get into some more advanced features on this. Cause like you have a pulse train input on the PowerFlex and you can do some really neat motion control features with that and some basic speed control features. Uh, the PowerFlex has opto outputs and relay outputs. So uh, it's a great opportunity for us to talk about what's the difference and why would we use one over the other? And we're gonna hit some more ethernet control with this one. Obviously we're gonna build out the connecting components workbench and the micro 800. We're also gonna build out the control logics compact logics, but we're also gonna talk about Modbus TCP. And we're also going to talk about controlling it over serial because in many cases, maybe we're replacing something, it's something legacy, or hey, that's just the way we want to do it. So we're going to talk about that we can do that. Drive faults. How do we read them? How do we understand what they mean? Dynamic braking. It's a really cool feature that allows you to turn the motor into a brake electrically without any friction. And yeah, we should probably cover it a little bit. You know, going back to that safety, uh, the PowerFlex on our trainer actually has safe torque off. And we're going to talk about that and the safety aspects of the PowerFlex 525. We've already hit the drive feedback loop where we can connect an encoder to it. But then there's also some really neat basic logic functions available in the PowerFlex drive that we're going to play with. You've got velocity step logic function. You've got your basic logic functions, your timer logic functions, your counter logic functions. I mean, there's a lot of neat stuff. And then, yeah, we are going to use our PowerFlex drive with the PID trainer also, because I did kind of miss that one early on. 
And I realized later that two things. One, we have a modified version of that PID trainer that we used in that series that runs off of PowerFlex Drive. But also, I can use the analog output on the PowerFlex Drive to control an off-the-shelf PID trainer. So we are going to back up and talk about how to integrate it into the PID trainer. Energy monitoring. I mean, that's a hot topic these days. And so, yeah, we want to do some exercises with energy monitoring. And then we're going to talk about some ways that you can take one drive to control another drive. Because a lot of times, maybe we have a really small scale PLC, or maybe we have a single analog input. And so it's going into one drive, but it also needs to go to another. So we're going to talk about some ways to do that. Let's see, and then we talked about the PID, yeah, the derivative, well actually proportional integral will be coming out soon. It's done. Derivative is done. That one was difficult, but I think I got it. We're going to talk about some auto tuning, and then we're going to talk about some manual tuning. And then we're also going to talk about acceleration and deceleration, because this is something that's often overlooked in a PID control, is maybe we're capable of shooting straight up to say a temperature in an oven. But if you take an oven from 100 degrees to 1000 degrees in a few seconds, that thing is gonna twist like a pretzel. So a lot of times you'll have to slowly bring something up or slowly bring it down just to kind of let it just kind of settle all in. So we're gonna talk about that. We're gonna talk about clamping. Obviously, the biggest one that I'm excited about, since this is a troubleshooting channel, is we're going to talk about troubleshooting PIDs. And we're going to talk about more about the differences between the dependent and the independent variable. Because I kind of, I won't say I messed that one up, but I kind of switched gears early on in this when I realized no math-wise it was easier to start with the independent variable. But we're going to follow back around and really talk about the difference between those two. Let's see, then we have some general video ideas. How do you know that you're connected to the right PLC? That's probably an important one. So yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna go and set this whole lab up here with all the PLCs and talk about some ideas on how to make sure that we're connected to the right one. Uh, we are going to try to tackle why the upload and download is swapped in a PLC. And really in the end, I just hope that we can get it through your head which way is which, so that we don't actually overwrite the program in the machine. Uh, we've got several people asking for more control panel type videos. One is calculating heat loss. Another is challenges to building UL508A control panels. How to calculate short circuit current ratings. What's the difference between primary and supplemental circuit protection? And we have a whole slew of people that really want us to go through the steps that it takes to become a UL panel shop. So I got to think about that one. I'm not sure. That one may be more than I want to bite off. I've got to, I don't know, got to brainstorm on that one. But put, yeah, definitely put your feedback on that uh, down in the comments because, yeah, that, obviously that's why I'm doing this whole episode is to get your feedback on these. We've got um, how to wire a single on a three-phase motor. That is one that we definitely should go through really thoroughly. Uh, the difference between shorting out an NPN versus a PMP sensor and output. That, that is a, that's a good one right there. I'll need to grab some hardware for it, but yeah, we'll definitely go through it. Then we've got some podcast ideas that people have sent in. Uh, we've got... Uh, the steps to get an automation and we've touched on that one and i think we will slowly continue to just sprinkle that through i got a lot of questions about what makes a good programmer i may dabble in that one now the history of electricity that's a really interesting idea a lot of people want me to talk about how did we get here and what's interesting about it is i'm so anti learning about the history at least up front when you're learning and so I usually leave it completely out, but I don't know. I'm, I'm gonna have to think about that one. Uh, we have a lot of questions about, actually we have this question from employees and employers as, is it important to have a degree as a technician? So we're gonna touch on it a little bit. And of course, as usual, I do have a pretty long list of hater questions. 
And luckily I have a just as long list of liker questions that are not really long enough for a full video or episode, but I'm probably gonna take a few videos and just answer questions. Probably another 44 question about PLCs type series. So out of all those, which ones really sparked your interest? Cause that's what I need to know because like I said, there's, yeah, it's 102 things on the list right now. And usually I kind of go through occasionally and I end up knocking some of them out where it's like, ah, oh, well, that's kind of close to this. I can merge these or no, that's too far out of what we do. But this is a good strong list right now. So yeah, I could use your help in figuring out which ones we should do and which ones we should scratch or which ones, even if you're not sure, which ones would you like to see done earlier and which ones we could push off till later. So let me know what you think in the comments. Till next time. Hi, this is Till. And this is Amber of TW Controls. We run the automation store. Hey, thanks for finding our channel. Here's a playlist with some similar videos. And YouTube thinks you'll like this video. Please like our video and subscribe to our channel. And if our videos have helped you make some money and you're not using our products, please consider supporting us on Patreon. Till next time. See ya.